Recording in progress. Welcome to Blackbird episode number 86. My name is James, and today I am pleased to bring back to the show Tessa Lena. Tessa, you will remember from, uh, I don't remember which episode of Blackbird, um, but it's it's been a little while, um, and a lot has gone on since the last time she was here. Um, Tessa writes on Substack and on her own website. She's a musician and songwriter, and uh, just kind of an all-around um, great cultural commentator. So, uh Without further ado, here is Tessa Lena. Tessa, welcome back to the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was it was wonderful to talk to you last time, so I look forward to this one. Great. Um, so what got me interested in having you back on was a tweet that, or I guess it was it was a Substack post um, a little while back. Uh, you were talking about how it feels like we're in a state of decay, and <clears throat> you talked about. Um, a, a restaurant scenario where I think people like people just came out of the kitchen and randomly saw a table in half or something like that. Is that, does that ring true? Uh, yes. Well, that, that happened in Moscow by now quite a number of years ago. And yeah. I was, I was, a, I was already living here in America. And so I came to visit and I was at a restaurant in the middle of the night, uh, downtown, and all of a sudden, the employees of the restaurant decided that it was a good idea to take a table and start sewing it in half. And they just randomly started doing that. And there was no rhyme or reason to that whatsoever. And I was like, OK, I guess. <laughs> so they just started destructing the table. And it was funny. But yeah, but <laughs> it was absurd. Yeah. What is what? how does that relate to like a society in the state of decay? Cause I've seen, I've seen some weird stuff like that happening. Um, and I, I want to know, I want to know why the word decay was the, was what you, which, what you picked in that piece. Uh, well, I think I remember that culturally from the time of the end of the Soviet Union, the, the actual after the fall of the Soviet Union. And there was a lot of great art made by, mm -hmm. Uh, Soviet filmmakers about this complete absurdity. It's like a carnival. It's like everybody's just doing whatever. There's no no standards, no rules. And in case of my old homeland, everybody's just stealing whatever they can, which I think applies to my current homeland in this current state as well. Yeah. So it's like a anything goes. And uh, that was the state. And I, I guess when people start doing just whatever with no standards decay shows up mm -hmm. and, and that actually applies to the the book that i was talking about the heart of a dog last the, yeah remember the book we talked about so they were specifically dis discussing the state of decay uh in that in that sense so when so when people start just doing whatever and like no standards then this is when d decay happens and destruction happens um so i like something that I've seen recently, I was at the gym and this guy, he just, he, he went swimming in this, in the swimming pool at the gym and he was just wearing tidy whitey underwears. Uh, and then he got out of the pool and he changed into another pair of tidy whitey underwear, uh, and then just put on his clothes over it. It, it just felt really weird and surreal. Like why, why don't at least like wear a pair of boxers or something different from the underwear you're about to put on. Um, it's stuff like that that kind of that kind of uh, feels like it relates to that scenario of the people sawing the table in half. Have you seen stuff like that here in the states as well? Well, plenty. In this case, perhaps he changed them because they were dry. I don't know. That's <laughs> that's my theory about why he would why he he would do that. Yeah. <laughs> but I've seen well here absurdity is rampant. And I cannot think of any particular case, but it's just you can tell that people are tired sure. and they don't they don't care and they just they just do whatever. I mean, I, I suppose I was talking about it maybe, I, I don't know, seven, eight years ago before any COVID when 
or customer service in this in, in this country. When I just came here, it was admirable from the standpoint of the Soviet person. Mm -hmm. People were polite and such. And then it just went away. And people could yell at you, kind of like the Soviet cashier, the classic. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, oh, this is this is this is not going the right direction. It's just culturally there's signs that people are tired, people don't care. And usually when that happens, then you know other things follow eventually. Yeah. What kinds of things do you think are in store here um, if if this decay continues? And I mean, is there is there a way to reverse decay, uh, cultural decay like this, do you think? I don't know. I think historically it usually runs its course. Yeah. I don't know. I keep hoping that if people sort of wake up to this reality soon, there might be a chance, you know, like miracles happen. I, I mean, I don't know, it's possible, but mm -hmm. historically, usually, usually when it goes towards decay, it goes all the way towards decay and then something else happens after. So, so I don't know, I'm not too optimistic about it. Yeah. I mean, are, do you think that there's ways that individuals can at least kind of, kind of, uh, fortify their own lives in order to um, not be too heavily and drastically impacted by it? Well, I'm sure. I think, <clears throat> well, even in the hardest times in history, individuals you know, hustle and try to do the right thing, and some people fare better than others. I think there's nothing new about that. So people survived the Soviet Union. Well, <laughs> not all of them, but many did, and then it ended. So I think it's a very long-term game in many ways, probably multi-generational game. Mm -hmm. And we are, we're not the first generation doing that to begin with, in like we're a continuation of somebody else. So, um, well, there's a lot of talk about growing your own food and trying to really move into that structure where you have barter relationships with people, you know, and that's probably very prudent for, for those who are in the position to afford it and to do that. What do you make of what's going on in the in Eastern Europe right now with Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and the rest? That is an extremely hard topic for me. And as I, I, mean, I in my recent post, I wrote that I'm not even ready to like, talk about it mm -hmm. much because it's too, you know, geopolitics is obviously complex and I don't think they're good guys in that game at yeah. all. It's, I think... The Ukrainian people are being sacrificed by both Russian and Western oligarchs, and that's what's happening. And that's kind of the cynical part of it. And everybody is corrupt, and people pay the price. And then, of course, on both sides, the the oligarchs and the politicians they try to ramp up the animosities. Yeah. Because, and I'm talking about West, West, and and Russia, because mm -hmm. Ukraine just happens to be in that like in a really unfortunate position. Ukrainian people and obviously there has been a struggle and the coup and the this and the that. I mean like it's just a mess but I'm not really ready to talk about it in any kind of analytical manner because sure. it's it's you know it's I'm from Moscow and Ukrainians are my brothers and sisters and Russians are my brothers and sisters and it's it's a big mess and I just mourn the fact that it is happening and of course there has been military action prior to that. I mean, it's it's just a big, big, big mess. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that it's targeted to probably be a war zone for a while. And it's it's not good. I'm very sad about it. Well, OK, so one of the things that you talk about a lot is propaganda. And um, it's my understanding that Ukraine is uh, I mean, it's like the ninth most corrupt country in the world by some metrics. Uh, so what do you make of turning um, Ukraine into this like uh, Christ like country, um, the, the you know, people putting the flag on their on their profile pictures and stuff. And like, I understand that that people who say they support Ukraine most of the time are saying that they support the people of Ukraine who are under attack. Um, but I think also the Ukrainian government is also kind of being lionized, um, in particular by the press. Uh, do you see that as, as media propaganda? Is, is there some truth to it? 
Um, do you know? I think I think there's several stories happening at the same time. Like, of yeah. course, the Ukrainian government is corrupt. The entire former Soviet Union. Well, first of all, everybody is terribly corrupt. Like, the America is terribly corrupt mm -hmm. too. Second of all, the entire Soviet Union has its own flavor of corruption, and whether it's Russia or Ukraine, terribly corrupt. Okay, it's just that, that entire culture where corruption is not something to be ashamed of. It's just corrupt, and that's how people think. That's anybody who can afford being corrupt is corrupt. There's actually taking it to a lighter note. There's a joke. Uh, from, from the Soviet times that applies, I think, to <clears throat> Russia and Ukraine and entire, that entire territory where two friends meet up and one says, so do you take bribes? And then the other says, no, 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 I don't take bribes. And then he says, the other friend says, well, does anybody try to bribe you? He goes, oh, unfortunately, no. So, I mean, like, that's that's the joke. <laughs> so he's not taking bribes because no. no because, like, yeah. So, so that is the entire culture. So I'm not even, it's like, I assume that it, it is horribly corrupt. And I think it's kind of a story that repeats through history where local leaders of a smaller country try to find alignments with bigger countries and some side with this empire and others side with that yeah. empire. And the empires might be in competition and the leaders, I mean, they might hope that they have their own emotional good and bad, like all human beings, but they primarily calculate which predator is going to protect them the most. And then marketing comes after. So I think it is a classic case in, because some of the power holders in Ukraine would try to side with Russia as a predator, as an empire. And then some would try to side with the United States of America or the Western countries as another camp of predators and empires. And I think this is what's happening on the cynical level. And then, of course, with the people, people are subjected to horrible suffering right mm -hmm. now. And that's a separate story. So I don't like to talk about it in a cold minded, like a lot of my friends are like, oh, OK, so if the mainstream media says Russia bad, Ukraine good, then it must be exactly the other way around, Russia good. Ukraine bad. I don't think that on the level of politician, they're any good guys at all. And obviously, the media story is its own story. Propaganda is horrible. and mm. But it's just what the media does. And just like, uh, well, America, American media likes to scold Russia. Russian media likes to scold America. And they're both lying through their teeth. And they're both trying to use any real reason or any imaginary excuse to just divert attention away from what's happening at home and both of my homelands do that and i don't have any kind words for either doing that so the propaganda is obscene so obviously people who couldn't find ukraine on a map just yesterday all of a sudden are filled with feelings and i'm sure the feelings are sincere <clears throat> but well, and they still can't find ukraine on the map just to just to be clear <laughs> No, that is true. But what I'm saying is that there are many, many, many yeah. multiple stories happening at the same time. And because it is close to home, I cannot go into that analytical mode. I mean, like, yes, there are biolabs. Yes, all that. But I don't mm -hmm. I'm sure that the invasion had nothing to do with I mean, it, not, not everything, at least it wasn't the main reason. So what the predators are doing, the predators are on both sides. And I'm talking about the West and Russia. And I think they equally share the blame. In this case, the invasion, the last reiteration of invasion is on Russia. And I mean, and that's my land. And I'm not saying it in the same way that, say, the American media says that, because mm -hmm. the American media is just like lying through their teeth. But the fact is, everybody is responsible for their actions. So there is an invasion. And people say it's in response. On the ground, I think. People are equally passionate on both sides. And Ukraine is not culturally homogenous. Mm -hmm. So some people feel very loyal to Russia. Some people, or Russian culture, I would say language, and by association, Russia, because it tends to maybe protect them. And then some people feel vehemently against and more pro-West in the same way. And the passions are equal. And I don't even feel that I'm in the position to judge the people because 
politicians have been playing human beings forever. This is universal. This is not specific to Ukraine or Russia or America. People have this, I mean, politicians, if they can divert attention from their faults, they invite an, uh, inv uh, invent an enemy. Mm -hmm. And in Ukraine, well, before my eyes, the relationship deteriorated, right? And I was blaming primarily the West up until, well, right now, because right now there's a war in, in, in this reiteration of it, and it's horrible. But it's like, well, when I was a kid, I don't think anybody could imagine Russians and Ukrainians fighting with each other. It's just, we're pretty much one people, right? I mean, like, it's like, and originally, uh, centuries ago, we were literally one people. That was, there were no Russians, there were no Ukrainians, we were one people. Mm -hmm. And then historically, it's just how it happens with national, like development of nations. So uh, the center that was based in Kiev, which was originally the center of this whole nation, well, before it was a nation, right? So the, the, the ancestors of Russians and Ukrainians. So that uh, developed into eventually Ukraine. And then what was a Moscow kingdom that was more recent than the Kievan kingdom, then it went under and the Tatars and it was in this entire mess. So it eventually developed into Russia. But we were, used to be one people. I imagine that thousands of years ago, we probably came from you know one clan mother or something like that so i as a human being i object to this purely analytical camp like there has to be a good guy and a bad guy i don't think that it applies i think that it's a case of political predators and oligarch predators throwing people under the bus mm -hmm. and nobody really cares about the people so I'm far more concerned about that than about like petty geopolitical analysis, like, oh, you know, 5D chess, this, that. Like, I'm sure this is happening, but I don't think that the solutions will come from that kind of analysis. It, I don't know if it makes sense. <clears throat> Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Of course, um, it's more of a it's uh, the more important part of this is the cultural rather than the political. Um, I noticed. So one thing that that I've always noticed is that when a particular region becomes like the the geopolitical and by geopolitical, I mean, of course, the American empire's um, area of focus, we start spelling and translating and, and pronouncing words differently um i i feel like that's part of that's part of the propaganda thing like if you're paying attention then you then you're going to change the way that you say and spell and stuff these words and so for instance when the middle east became the uh the the area of focus um here in america they changed the spelling of muslim from m-o-s-l-e-m -E to m-u-s-l-i-m um and now we're seeing that also with kiev which uh i noticed that you pronounce um, key, uh, closer to Kiev, which is how the news media is now pronouncing it. Um, and the spelling changed. It's no, no longer K I E V it's K Y I V. Do you, do you think that that is some way of manipulating the language? Uh, well, again, it is complicated. Well, the new spelling, it's not new. It didn't show up today. Right. That's how, uh, well, based on the Ukrainian language. So uh -huh. previously it was spelled in English based on the Russian pronunciation. Okay. Then a few years ago when, uh, well, the mood changed and the, 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 I mean, again, with some help from the West, I think that people would not have gone into this degree of militancy without the help from the West. The militancy, but I mean, like, that's again, that's what leaders do. Honestly, people should not batter on every side and people go for that every time. So whatever says, oh, look, enemy, and then people go for it. So, but going back to the spelling, it changed a few years ago. And also there was the, the whether you use the with Ukraine. And even in the Russian language, there were political requirements of how to use certain like prepositions, like hmm. in, how do you say in Ukraine, in Russian. So I think... It is fair for Ukrainian people to ask for whatever spelling they want, 
I mean, and it's not a big deal. It's it's kind of like I, I don't really care when it comes to demands to change the Russian language. I don't think it's fair because I think the Russian language goes by the rules of the Russian language. Obviously, the Ukrainian language goes by the rules of the Ukrainian language. I mean, like that's obvious. And then the English language can choose. Pe speakers can choose what to do. I think there are much bigger problems to worry about than how we spell Kiev either way. And it's like, if it's important, then why not? So, I mean, I don't really, I don't really sweat over that. That, of course, the story, the media story, the politician story in the West, they would politicize anything. They would politicize, I don't know, natural immunity. Like who would have yeah. thunk? So they would politicize anything that they can. So I always separate the different parties participating in a story. And I try to, I don't know, just be as peaceful as possible about it. That's my personal approach. So I think that being too belligerent about anything, I mean, like it doesn't really amount to much good. I mean, yes, people can prove their right or whatever. They, they, they have the right to do whatever. But in the end, if it's about peace, then, I mean, you comp compromise on things that are important and you don't pay attention to charlatans and liars. It's, I, it's, it's a very, you know, it's a complex dance of life, I think. But for sure, people do change language. And it's the same thing with, for example, when Russian Revolution happened, when the Bolshevik, Bolsheviks uh, had this coup in 1917, they changed the language, they changed some letters. Actually, after the uh, Chinese invasion of Tibet, the same thing happened. You know, they, they changed some things. So this is, this is what always happens, I think. And then if people have been suffering, then they embrace whoever tells them that, you know, this is now your new freedom, your new identity, and this is how it goes. Um, so you mentioned natural immunity. I guess we should we should get into COVID and what's going on. Um, <clears throat> well, or what's not going on, uh, probably more importantly. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have never been cynical enough because it was a global thing. I've never been cynical enough to believe that the COVID hysterica, hysteria um, was mainly to get Donald Trump out of office. And so I'm also not cynical enough to think that uh the 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 new russia narrative is meant to keep democrats in office in in, in this election year um that said i'm really frequently wrong on my on my political uh analysis what do you think there um is there, is there I mean, obviously, the Great Reset and the World Economic Forum probably has more to do with this than the Democrats and Republicans. But uh, do, do you have any opinions as far as kind of where that where that's going and what's happening in the information war? Uh, well, and also, what is the meaning of life? I mean, two small questions. <laughs> where this is going <laughs> and the meaning of life. Yep. Well, it's it's. It's very hard to say, like, I'm sure that, again, everything is happening. So that memo that I'm sure you've seen to the Democrats about, OK, now we stop talking about COVID. Now we say that we won. So there was this absolutely beautiful memo. And so on that level, it's true. I'm sure the Democrats, even though there's a great reset and the, the, the difference between the two is kind of irrelevant on the grand scale anyway for the people and corruption is rampant nonetheless people on their level are still like hustling right so i think that there's a change in messaging that might have a bunch to do with the fact that democratic policies have completely driven a lot of people like turned people off and they're like uh oh maybe we'll overdone it now we have to talk over it. I, I'm sure this is happening, but, and well, this is happening, but as far as the grand trends, I don't know, it's very, it's very puzzling because I think that the great trendsetters are just mar marching forward and they're marching forward regardless. I mean, they're marching forward over our heads. And now that all the attention is on this war, but the digital ideas are still being developed 
the financial, you know, the digital dollar and potentially programmable money, this is all still happening. And it's still in the <clears throat> oven. So it is possible then, you know, when the media switches its highlights from the war, even if the war hasn't ended by then, but they just magically, you know, how media just stops caring, right? It's just like today, this is the tragedy, to, and then tomorrow, something else is a tragedy. So then it is possible that, like, oh, by the way, and here's your digital dollar. Oh, and here's your digital ID. Oh, you weren't paying attention, were you? Yeah. Well, you know, it was just hiding behind the bushes. But see, we really had no plans to do it. We really, we really had no plans to do it. But now because of this war, you know, Putin and supply chains and all that. And, you know, the usual thing. And, and then here we have it. So I think this is where we're heading. I think nobody has given up on, well, I mean, like it's clear, like the digital ideas are being developed. Mm -hmm. And Biden just issued an executive order about, you know, digital, uh, like crypto and digital uh, CBD, like CBDC potentially. Mm -hmm. So it's happening and I think they're just going for it. And if, and now they can blame everything on Putin and Ukraine. So, inflation and everything so i think it's looking pretty grim but at the same time there's always hope that there are rulers are too stupid to pull it through correctly <laughs> and yeah. that with the peasants yeah. will find that you know find wiggling room and again we're in the same existential conundrum like before right so it's mm. like it's, it's a dance that is completely mysterious yeah, I, I noticed that YouTube has now started censoring Russian uh, Russia misinformation, um, which I, I mean, obviously it was coming, but like they're not even they're not even pretending that I mean, you know, when they were censoring COVID misinformation, well, hell, you're going to kill people if you if you spread misinformation about COVID. But with Russia, there's not really any stakes like that. Um, if you if you say something that YouTube disagrees with on Russia, well, it's not like it's going to cause someone to cause this catch this deadly virus. Um, <laughs> so I well, guess I mean, like they're doing it with everything. They're doing it with climate. They're doing yeah. it with oh, everything. that's true. But, yeah, and then well, potentially with climate, you you cannot think wrong thoughts because if you think wrong thoughts, then everybody's going to die. But I think they just really, I mean, that seems clear that they've just trained people they've used the COVID, or mm -hmm. whatever it's worth you know to train people to react to have this knee jerk reaction <clears throat> and when they started earlier with political correctness which i was saying years prior that that's just a training mechanism to destroy the standards and to make people like people who feel good about themselves to make it a sin and I mean, again, this is all nuanced and complex, but the way it is being used, it's just that if you feel good about yourself, if you feel free, if you want to talk or say what you want, then you're a bad person, and you're the enemy, and you got to be obedience trained. And that's what they're doing. And they did it masterfully with COVID, and now they're just <clears throat> applying it to everything. And by the way, not just YouTube, that, that go. It also- Yes. That's right, DuckDuckGo, which DuckDuckGo has always d built itself as a privacy search engine. Um, they've never, they've never built themselves as like the uh, the the place to go to get alternative information. Um, <clears throat> I think they kind of used that loophole. I mean, their CEO got on Twitter and uh, kind of justified that. Um, uh, what was it? Oh, they were downgrading. They were downgrading in their algorithm um, what they considered to be Russian misinformation. Um, and the, the, the CEO Twitter, he, he tweeted, yeah, you come to us for privacy. Uh, and you're also now coming to us for like our spin on the, on the facts. Um, that's so but weird. I, I think honestly, like I've never, and to this day, I don't think that there's a platform that is like fighting for you. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't exist. Well, right now I really like Substack because they don't censor. And it seems like it's also their commercial proposition that they don't censor. Yeah. But there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee with any of those things. So, <clears throat> you know, the management may change. Somebody may mm -hmm. make them an offer they can't 
refuse. Yeah. Somebody may pressure them. Well, legislation can change. So it's like there's no privacy and no no censorship zone that is guaranteed. And even like people go so Telegram. Telegram is owned by a bunch of my compatriots in the Saudi. I mean, like, please, like what? So it's like, uh, so I was not shocked about DuckDuckGo. Plus, even, for example, there's this writer, Yasha Levine, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't agree with him on COVID. He went full mainstream, but uh, prior to that, he wrote this really good book called Surveillance Valley. And it's about essentially uh, highlighting the relationships between various agencies and big tech platforms and you know the internet that actually never left the realm of the military and you know intelligence it never really went into this free expression commercial thing like we were taught it always stayed in the military realm so it's not no surprise but then he also researched like tor the the browser which is actually according to him and i believe he's correct a honeypot oh. like signal also honeypot and so I don't think that there is any sort of like safe haven when it comes to privacy or no censorship. And I think Proton Mail, for example, that is considered all like secure and private, I think they were doing something with Google. And I think DuckDuckGo, even before this, was actually selling data to Google, search data or something along those lines. So it's like, I think we can pretty much assume that they are in this together <laughs> not not with us and that it's all at some point going to some kind of a you know alphabet agency yeah no matter what browser no matter what platform um you recently reposted uh a a piece you wrote on your old sub stack um talking about the uh the establishment and the machine um can you can you kind of give a summary of what you were talking about there the two stories um i thought it was really nice uh i mean it was painful obviously and it was painful for you to write um but it was a good reflection i thought uh well thank you i well i actually almost completely forgot about this story and uh as i was thinking the recent concept context why i reposted it i'm in new york right and mm. so they canceled wink wink the mandates so technically uh the unclean people <clears throat> are allowed back in the restaurants and and such and gyms and i feel it just numb about it it's like there's i personally fought so hard to you know for the mandates to be cancelled because of you know segregation and it's not good and it's just like shameful but once they did first of all they didn't do it with a heart they didn't do it with an apology as in mm. oh my god we, we messed up so let, let's fix it like obviously they didn't do it this way they did it like they were right and now now they're very generously quote unquote giving us our freedom back which is absurd which is an insult it wasn't theirs to begin with and Plus, they did it in such a way that children under, I think, four still have to mask, which is abusive and wrong and just mm -hmm. like an unscientific. So <clears throat> they kind of just, they're saying, we're well, right, we can do it again at any point. And then the shops can still mandate it if they want. And then some restaurants still have the sign that they're unclean, not allowed. I mean, that's not what the sign says, but effectively. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and it's just... It's just all wrong and i was thinking so, so so what do i do so the proper apology didn't come and i, I apologize i'm very sorry I have to do no this. problem no problem Hello? we'll just wait for her to come back i apologize i'm waiting for an important package oh that I absolutely cannot miss okay so, no problem so I'm back. And uh, so, so yes, and I was thinking about this establishment and the machine and the feeling of like almost helplessness that you feel when they're just doing whatever they want. They are just doing absolutely whatever they want. And, and then what? And 
and then I realized that I've already written about it and I've written about it before any COVID. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so that was the situation when actually on the heels of original Ukraine media narrative change. Uh, so after 2014, well, the, the animosity started building up prior to that, right? So, and the West was obviously helping to create a mood in the Ukrainian people that the West is a friend and Russia is the enemy, which is, well, frankly, quite dishonest because again, Russians and Ukrainians had a relationship for a long time and America is on another continent. Yes. Yeah. None of the America's business, regardless of everything else, right? But anyway, so the animosities have been created successfully. And again, the history is complex and very, very complex going, going through centuries. And I would say that by fairness, Crimea should probably be Turkish, because if we look at who owned it first, then it's neither Russia nor Ukraine. But, and I don't care, like as long as people are happy, people who are there, I really don't care. Like, uh, I, I think the politics is silly, but <clears throat> so the animosity started building. And I remember the change in the mood and that was, that was over 10 years ago. Now, maybe not, yeah, over 10 years ago, even before the Crimea, the mood changed. All of a sudden, like Ukrainians don't like Russians, as in like there's something in the air. Like I'm sure that individual people are still individual people and, and, and wonderful and kind, and, but that, that mood changed. And I remember being kind of heartbroken about it. And then in 2014, uh, with all the turmoil, Russians became the bad guys very, very officially in the Western like media. And so it became a liability to be Russian. And then with like the previous elections and all the hoopla with like Putin, Trump, blah, 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 which whatever. Uh, I don't even want to go in there because it's like not worth it. But mm. <laughs> so being Russian became a big liability as in it's like you're the hated person. And so, and I think the package is coming. I'm on my, my I'm on my very serious speech. Well, hopefully it just dropped it off. Oh, sorry. Okay, sure, no problem. <laughs> Sorry about that. I instructed them to live it here. See, this is li living in New York. Yeah. <laughs> Very much in the trenches. So with that, I just remember how it's almost like if you're a consultant, <clears throat> I was doing some consultancy and getting clients became difficult almost it's like there was a practical side to that not just that you became emotionally like the wrong type of person but also i remember that happening it was actually very very interesting and then it subsided then it subsided oh, probably i mean i don't know there was this bump after 2014, then it subsided. And then I forgot about it. And especially when with COVID, everybody forgot about all that. Yeah. And then now, again, as you know, even Reuters wrote a story about how violence, call, calling for violence against Russians, they, uh, like Facebook or Metaverse, whatever, Meta, they are now officially allowing calling for violence against Russians which is a joke. And I have to say that prior in the previous cycle, like 2014, I was really heartbroken about it. So all of a sudden you're a bad person. Why? Because you're Russian, because of your ethnicity, like you're bad, ethnic, you're ethnically bad. So that was painful. And then it went away. And then now I don't care. Actually, like I don't really read the mainstream media too much and my friends are normal and I don't have any corporate gigs, like nothing, no corporate jobs. So that does not really impact me. And I have developed thick enough of a skin. I mean, like mm -hmm. I genuinely care not at all 
what they say about Russians. But I can imagine that for a lot of people experiencing it in, to that degree for the first time, I mean, like it's extremely painful. And also the fact that they're like firing people for whatever Russian news, I mean, this is, this is bad. And going back to that piece, I wrote it when I was actively thinking about, well, various areas. First, as being Russian and how it makes you kind of the wrong kind of citizen. And in general, how the establishment just eats you and it has no respect whatsoever. And we are pretending that we have a status or whatever, but in reality, the machine does not respect us at all. Just at times it's hidden from us and at times it's very, very visible. And funny enough, in 2019, there was no COVID yet. So I had no idea. Yeah. I thought we were actually like at the close to the bottom. I thought it was really bad back then. Little did I know that it would get significantly worse. So that, that's a story. Have you, um, so it, it seems to me, and this is because I, I always make fun of myself that I'm, I'm a blue pilled person wearing a red pilled mask because like during COVID, uh, if I would see people on television not wearing masks, I, I got a little, ooh, they're not following the rules, um, twinge uh, in my brain, even though like I knew I knew that like wearing masks is not normal. Um, and so it, it seems to me that like – and so yesterday I heard someone talking on the phone um, and he was speaking Russian. And for just a second, I got that little twinge of, ooh, there's someone speaking Russian. That's weird. Um, and – uh, or like during COVID, if someone coughed in public or like after 9-11, um, if someone is speaking Arabic on the subway or whatever, uh, do you have you gotten any like dirty looks or or weird reactions because of your accent by chance in the last few weeks? I mean, uh, no. Oh, good. And I mean, like my my circles are very, very good. And I if I did. I completely ignore them. I mean, like, I genuinely, I so, on a personal level, I so don't care about it right now. Yeah. Like, there's so many things that are far more important. Like, I'm dealing with a lot of things. Like, I mean, I'm just not even registering mm -hmm. that on a personal level. I'm registering it on the media, but I already went through that a few years ago. And right now, it's just, like, I genuinely don't care at all so i don't notice and but then well the funny thing is what, what you're talking about is actually interesting i have anecdotes that have nothing to do with russianness but it's very interesting because even with the masks although i've been sort of against them from the very beginning well in the very very early in the pandemic when we were told to not wear it Mm -hmm. I was yeah. thinking maybe there so was some benefit to it, and I was wearing wearing it briefly. And then uh, there was a very drunk guy breathing in my proximity while I was in a mask. That was like early March, 2020, and I was like, "Wait a second, I can smell everything. What good does it do?" So that was my waking <laughs> up moment. <laughs> but uh, even so, after that long of psychological training, even though. And like, I think the opposite, even so sometimes, you know, seeing an open face on a sub, which is like mine too, but mine, I don't see. It's like you register it and you like this, oh, an exception, like that feeling, oh, it's an exception. But, and I think it comes from just brainwashing. And, and I remember actually completely unrelated to either of those topics, but something completely striking a few years ago. Uh, well, in my circles, uh, the, it was a lot of like environmentalists and people uh, going with political correctness sincerely. And I remember just watching a group of kids. I was in the street and there was a group of school kids, like really young kids, maybe six, seven, eight years old, like six, seven. And a lot of them and a lot of them looked like me so they were white right and, and and i looked at those kids and the thought in my mind was like stupid white people they're going to grow up and destroy <laughs> and i was like 
wait, like it wasn't my thought. It wasn't what I think. It wasn't what I feel. But the thought just showed up in my head. And it was not a loving thought. It was a thought of like a bad, like, and I was like, that's not even what I, what, yeah. how? And it was really alarming because if it showed up in my head, so, okay, so I, I registered it, I caught it, and I was like, this is bullshit. And like, no human being should be thought about from the hatred standpoint, mm -hmm. obviously. I mean, like, obviously, regardless, like, black, white, purple, dotted, doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter, right? Like, that's obvious. Yeah. But it's the thought that that moment was to me a learning moment because I was like, wow, that's what they're doing. I mean, and it was obvious intellectually mm -hmm. that that's what they were doing. And they were using, like, I'm convinced that people who are on the top level who are promoting this political correctness and all that, they pretend to care about the indigenous or about <laughs> the anybody, they definitely don't care. They're just using it to confuse. They're using it to, to capitalize on the existing problems, on the existing trauma, on the very real historic tragedies. Yeah. And they're just using that to do whatever they want to do and to keep everybody down. And if they temporarily elevate like certain representatives of a particular group, they will toss them. Yep. Like it's inevitable. They will eventually toss them. It's like what America does with foreign leaders. It temporarily elevates and then it has no problem killing them. It's like when you deal with the betrayers, the betrayers betray. And that girl goes back to, of course, Ukraine because uh, like for instance, it's like, imagine if you have an uncle who maybe is not great. I mean, he's like somewhat abusive, but you have a relationship, right? And then somebody from another town comes and say, oh my God, we're going to sue this uncle. Like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you money. This uncle is abusing you. This uncle is an asshole. Like totally tell him, tell him. And then you go like, oh, uncle, you're an asshole. I'm going to sue you. And then that person from another town just goes away. And now, whatever it's like it's like that it's like that that is i think what essentially happened with ukraine aside from all other geopolitics and messing up with energy prices and the great reset and all that and like all that is happening but on the purely psychological level what the west did it kind of gave fake confidence to U ukrainian oligarchs or ukrainian leaders who counted on the west to be the supportive force like regardless of everything else. And then they just like, oh, sorry. Oh, now you have a war. Oh, how horrible, bye-bye. So this is like, again, betrayal. And I mean, I don't even know where I'm going with that, but I think that, oh, so I was talking about the uh, playing on the, on the hostilities and playing mm -hmm. on the trauma. And that's what they're doing now. And now there's a war and it's actually, I mean, like it's, it's bad. Like it's bad because any war is bad. War in Yemen is bad. War in Syria is bad. War in Ukraine is bad. Anywhere it's people, it's, it's, it's not good at all. And now they're using that suffering to promote whatever agenda on both sides, actually. So it's, it's a very tragic situation existentially. And like my own, well, there's no solution really. There's no quick solution to any of that. But my own approach is to always try to relate to other human beings before any other theory, which is why, by the way, in the beginning of our conversation where like, I didn't really want to talk about it, even about the Ukrainian mm -hmm. situation, because it's like, it's so hard to do it justice. And it is far more important to me that people are not bombed, no matter who drops the bombs. <clears throat> but it's just like people like you and I, I mean, like nobody counted on having a war in their life, right? It's like, it's not good. And that's far more important relating to the people than siding with this side of politics or that side of politics. So like, to me, this is my universal answer to how eventually to get out of this crap. Um. Yeah, it, it you can kind of tell that 
you can kind of tell that they don't actually care because um, there are there are very real like legislative, programmatic, infrastructural changes that could be made to um, significantly improve the status um, and the state of uh, his, like historically downtrodden people and currently downtrodden people that they never they, they don't enact those they 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 do symbolic things um <clears throat> so earlier you told a soviet joke and it was hilarious and i've noticed that soviet humor and jewish humor uh kind of two of the most um two of the most oppressed people historically. I mean, Jewish people have been oppressed forever and ever. Uh, Soviets during the entire Soviet Union reign were oppressed. And the humor that comes out of that situation is some of the best humor that humanity has to has to offer. Why do you think that is, that oppression breeds just c- comedic genius? For Well, I mean, you have to survive, right? Yeah. I mean, like, what else do you do? You laugh. I think that when you can't it's like you know where you either cry and die or you make fun of the of the assholes who try to oppress you Mm -hmm. because after all i think it's important to see them not as just scary people i mean they are scary people but they're also often foolish and they're worth laughing at yeah and i guess also just kind (laughs) of you you either have to laugh or 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 man just despair um exactly. the, the way the way i see the current situation playing out so the american empire is in a state of decay there's not really anything that can take its place other than a complete societal de- collapse or um this technocracy that klaus schwab would like to bring about um <clears throat> and so that would be like a global empire uh, that is led not by democratically elected politicians, but by corporate, uh, the, 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 the elite of the elite. Um, do you think one of those is preferable to the other? Or do you think I'm off base? Is there is there another option? Uh, again, it boils down to complexity. It <clears throat> is, <clears throat> you know... Like, oh, <laughs> Next I'm asking you what the meaning of right. life is. So just... <laughs> right. Uh, so I think, like, my theory is that the mess that we're in, it has been building up for several thousands of years, at least, right? Mm. So the gradual transition to this <clears throat> algorithmic, mechanical, intellect-based morality, and I mean, it's just not alive, really. So, but it's built, building up for, 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 for many centuries, that separation from nature. So it might take us a while to get back on track. And oh my God, something is falling. See, this is this is life in New York. <laughs> <laughs> like, as long as, as long as your building doesn't fall down, I think we're all right. We can we can we can we can last. All right. So sorry about that. I mean, like no. this is realism. This is the complexity. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> so I think that the challenge of the current situation is that. Uh, people have to realize that the abuses that have done have been done to the people in the past, that they were not an abstraction. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, when the original people of this land were invaded, <clears throat> they were minding their business. They were leaving their, uh, they were having their freedom. Their freedom was taken away from them. And now Klaus Schwab is trying to take our freedom, like modern people's freedom away from us. And it's the same thing. It's not so if they win, they will describe their story as the people who wanted the freedom today, they were backwards and it's it's exact same story where you know we we didn't take your freedom away, we made you more civilized, we made you we put whatever like sensors in your body to help you with to monitor diseases that's good for you. Mm -hmm. It's there can always be a story that is written. And I think that the actual solution to get out of this wacky circle of misery is to go back to a very simple way of feeling about this world. And I mean, like, this is not a big word. It may sound like just some lofty nonsense, but I think that is actually the solution because if 
we get away from that brainy way of thinking about ourselves, about our lives, about from in intellect-based morals as opposed to heart-based like morals. If we do that, then I think there will be some kind of like an emotional chemical reaction almost. Like all the other stuff will eventually fall off and it may fall off in ways that we can't even, even think of right now because life is very mysterious. But without us doing that, if we continue trying to be like the analyst, the, the brainy smart person who wants to dominate the narrative mm -hmm. or dominate other people, I think that is actually the proverbial virus that is driving the mess, the emotional one. And you know, my, my friend Stephen Newcomb has uh, the wonderful term that is called the system of domination. I think that is what it is. I, I, and I added to that saying like a ghost of domination. It's almost this emotion that drives us yeah. to neglect the free will in others, to neglect the right to sacred relationship with the divine, whatever it is, however the person feels about it, whatever words the person uses for that. So if we start respecting that, and I mean from the inside, not just because somebody read a book and decided it's a good thing, but if people awaken through whatever mystery of life to that feeling that, oh my God, other people actually, I mean, they're sacred. And I mean, they have that thing that is theirs and it's not up to me to dictate to them how to have this relationship mm -hmm. with the world. I think that when that happens and when that happens in many people, miracles will happen. And I think until then, the hopes are slim. I mean, like individually, people can still figure out a way how to maneuver it and be happy and even thrill, probably, even with the great reset and everything, depending on the person and the circumstance and all that, because people are very, very adjustable and emotionally very resilient in the end. <clears throat> but as far as getting out of the circle, I think that the great reset serves almost like it's a grotesque version of everything that has happened before it's grotesque it's completely awful it takes everything bad that existed and puts it on steroids and just gives it in a completely almost like cartoonish way but i think this is a life's way to show it to us that like that's what it is like here it is in your face now and it's ugly and maybe there has to be a way like internally different so th that is my interpretation of it i think that on the other end eventually when we come out of it on the other end whenever that is whether it's now or a thousand years later or a few generations later or tomorrow i don't know but whenever we come out of it i think we'll be in a better place i think we'll be stronger and wiser um so i told you my next question was going to be the meaning of life um <clears throat> i've been asking I've been asking guests this uh, because I'm, I've really been thinking about it a lot lately. Uh, and I'd like to know if you have an answer to it. Do you think that there is um, sort of a telos, like a, like a, like a function, like a prime function or a um, purpose for humanity in general, not like the individual, you know, maybe my purpose is to ask great questions and your purpose is to use words real good so that people, people can um, better understand the world, but like to, for humanity in general. Wow. See, <laughs> told you. <laughs> well, I actually do, but I did not expect to talk about it. Uh, well, I think the purpose of humanity is the <clears throat> choice and the free will because it is a nature of a human being to uh, forget while we're here and well there's a sort of mythological story that is pretty common in different older cultures and I believe that it's probably true is that human beings before coming to earth choose what like that particular person wants to do and but the point is that when we are born we forget that that's the deal so 
we know and then we're, bo we're born we forget and then as we live as we grow up and then function as an adult well hopefully sometime before adulthood we actually remember and the mechanisms and that are completely like screwed up in modern society but uh the point is i think and of course i don't know i mean like i'm not no. answering the question i mean I, that's 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 how i feel about it right now i think that imagine if you actually know like everything right then choice is a mood thing like of course if you know that if you go that way then the, i mean like it's there's no choice and the point of experiencing free will is that you actually choose, like you can choose, you can choose good, good, you can choose bad, you can choose wisely, you can choose like foolishly, you can choose things that are good for you, you can choose things that are horrible for you, you can, it's still going to go its natural path, so if you choose things that are good for you, you're probably better off, but I think that the point of the human species is choice and finding love through that because i do think that the foundation of everything is love and it's very hard to see that in the messes like in the everyday and with the cruelty and also as a word like what does the word mean it means nothing right like really it's like there's lots of people who just charlatans <clears throat> using this word right? but on the level of feeling that you realize that Things are actually beautiful. Even whatever is happening right now, there's still beauty in it and the opportunity to be courageous and opportunity to find people who are accepting you and loving you for who you are, who are respecting you. Like I connected to you, it's beautiful, right? We wouldn't have connected probably if not for the great reset. Mm -hmm. And true. True. And so on the some fundamental level, I think it's like, you know, when you have an adventure and it's tough and you sweat and you cry and you bang your head on the wall and it's like oh my god it's like why it's just like sometimes it feels like absolutely like like impossible like really bad and then if you keep at it and keep it and, and you work through it and then you insist and you pray and the universe guides you whatever you i mean eventually you get out of it like whatever it was eventually you get out of it and then you look back and you're like wow it actually makes sense and now you're a stronger person you're a wiser person you're a more balanced person and it might have taken you years but in the end of the journey i think that at the end of the journey we're in your deathbed mm. it's supposed to make sense and at least you know this is this is how i feel about it and the, so yeah good question great well good answer too thank you so much um okay. I, as we as we close out, why don't you go ahead and um, give your plugs if you have any sites or social media handles or anything that you would like for people to follow? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I am Tessa Fights Robots, and my Substack is Tessa Fights Robots, and uh, so it's Tessa.substack.com, and then my music is Tessa Makes Love. So if you Google either Tessa Fights Robots or Tessa Makes Love, then you'll find me. And, and I have to apologize <clears throat> for all the technical issues and it's actually a miracle that my internet stayed up and i was <laughs> yeah. completely convinced this was going to be audio so it's like <laughs> i know last time we last time we talked you called in because your internet was was on the fritz so i'm glad that today it was a little bit smoother i'm sorry i didn't i didn't mention that it was uh video on the on the email i, I it must have i must not have changed the email template that gets <laughs> sent out so thanks for flexing for us um and hopefully we will talk again soon i really appreciate your time today Oh, absolutely. Thank you. It's, Thank it's you. a joy. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.